Welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the Art of Programming using Scala. We continue talking about spatial data structures here, and in particular we're going to talk about grids. So, in the last video, um, in the last video we ran our brute force uh, neighbor finder. We, we wrote this up. Uh, we didn't actually test it at this point. That would actually be a very good thing to do. Maybe after writing this we'll, we'll spend a video writing some test code so that we can test both the, the brute force and what we're going to write this time. So if I go through and have a whole bunch of random data, the idea of the brute force is that it has to check basically all pairs of particles to find uh, all of the neighbors or for a single particle what we wrote here is that it goes through and it has to check against every other particle in order to to find out what's what's nearby. This is well not all that efficient and after all especially if we're in the realm and this is what the assumption we're going to make we're going to make the assumption that we are searching for a small area relative to the entire thing. If you have to find everything that's within a large circle you know that, that takes up most of the data well you're stuck with order n squared uh, for the for your overall searching or for with order n uh, when you do for a single particle because you've made it so there are order n things inside of the search radius so you really can't get around that uh, if you make that if you work that way but for most of the applications where you will use this type of thing you're searching for a small uh, search radius relative to the size of the entire data set and so the simplest way that we can make this uh, more efficient is to lay out on our data a grid. And so this is just a, a graphical representation. I've picked a grid size here so that, rough, so that the number of grid cells is roughly equal to the number of points that we have. Uh, so there's pretty much one grid cell per point, which because the, the points are not evenly distributed, we have some that are empty here and then we have others that have multiple, and if we were to add more data points, you can see that the grid cells have to get smaller in order to uh, to accommodate those those additional data points. So, if I wanted to do a search on say this point with a grid, I only have to search out inside of grid cells. So the the way that we build our grid is each one of these grid cells winds up having a list of particles in it. So this grid cell right here would contain this, this, and this and its neighbor would contain that one, and this neighbor would contain those two, and I'm not exactly certain where that one goes because it's right at the four-way intersection, uh, and the graphics aren't high enough resolution for me to tell. Um, but if I wanted to find the, the nearest neighbors of this one, at the very least, I have to search these nine squares, okay? because it could be right on a boundary, in which case there is no way for me to get away from uh, searching these four, and it's just easiest if, if you search in this area. If we wanted to have a larger radius, something that was significantly larger than, uh, than the cell size, <clears throat> then we would have to you know, kind of branch, uh, branch out and search not just the adjacent nine, but maybe add an extra layer on so that we're in a five by five and we search for tw in 25 squares, etc. cetera. Uh, the question is what order? is this? Well, that depends upon a lot of assumptions. Okay? As long as the size of these squares is uh, fairly small, it turns out that in practice, while I drew this, uh, I drew this so that there's one square per, per data point. For example, in my simulation code, if I were to use a grid, I drew empirical uh, tests, I found that it's actually most efficient if there are seven squares per data point. And the reason for that is because normally I'm searching for a fairly small circle around this and it's simply more efficient to to have lots of, of to have quite a few empty squares um, then it's more efficient that way than it is to have one per square which means that you'll occasionally get these squares that have large numbers of, of points inside of them. So what we want to do is we want to write a neighbor finder that instead of being brute force is based upon having a a grid. So 
let's come in here and we're going to make a new Scala class. This is going to be our grid neighbor finder. It's worth noting that the uh, the book has code for various neighbor finders and it uses a more elaborate um, interface that actually has, has not just finding for a single point but also finding for multiple points. Okay, so our following our brute force I'm going to go ahead and copy actually let's go ahead and copy from here on out okay and now this is unhappy because we don't have our one method in there okay so in the case of the grid neighbor finder, we when we get the points here, the first thing that we have to do is build up our grid. So I need to make a val that is the grid, and probably the easiest way to do this is to go ahead and write a function called make grid that we pass the points to. Um, I'm also going to make the assumption on my grid that my dimensionality is 2. Okay. Uh, one of the limitations of grids is that they work very well for two dimensions as we kind of saw here. If you scale this up to three dimensions you it, it still functions but it turns out that the number of, of cells that you start having so for example a, a hundred by a hundred uh, grid has a nice 10,000 cells in it. 100 by 100 by 100 3D grid now has a million and once you go above three dimensions it starts to become non-tractable. So we're just going to make the assumption here that our grid is fixed at two dimensions and when we call distance we'll be passing in uh, two as the value of the dimensions. So um, and technically the way I've done this I'll just say make grid. The question is what does grid return? Well based upon our image here this could be nicely represented as an array of array of say list of A. Okay so we have an array that holds inside of it arrays and each one of those has lists of A inside of it. First we need to figure out how big the array of arrays is um, based upon you know, what's, what's in that image we can go with say for example making uh, one grid cell per particle or roughly one grid cell per particle. If we want to do it that way um, we will, and I'm going to go with the assumption this is square here, which is not always true, but we'll, I'm not going to deal with the, the additional math there. Um, so my count here, if I'm going to have you know, number of bins by a number of bins, well then the number of bins is the square root of the number of points which gives us a um, a double and I can't make arrays of size double so there's a function called seal for sealing which basically always rounds up and that's kind of what I want here is I want the next most uh, the next number up as far as the count for how many bins we have now at this point I can make my uh, the grid that I'm going to create and this is also going to be the thing that I return at the end and I'm going to use array.fill and I'm going to make it count by count and all the lists start off as nil oh, and we're going to need to call to int okay the ceiling gives you back an integer, but it has uh, type double. Um, 
So we need to explicitly convert that to an int, otherwise we can't make an array using it. And this is unhappy because the type doesn't quite match, so we will specify the type actually nil as a list of a there. Okay, so now this should be happy. Oh, over here we have a little error because we didn't pass in d, so we can explicitly specify two. And now I have my array, I have my count, and all I need to do is figure out uh, what values go in what cells. And we're going to break for this video here, and we'll come back in the next video and finish filling in this code.